I'll rewind. Today's case is especially important because the killer is eligible for parole next year and could be released into the public. This is a case that really hits home for me because it happened near where I live and the little girl was around my age when she disappeared. So today we're going to be talking about the very sad case of 10 year old Holly Jones, who would be kidnapped and murdered only 200 meters from her own home. She'd also be the first Amber Alert ever issued in Canada. Holly Maria Jones was born on September 14th of 1992 in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Her parents were Maria Jones and George Stonehouse, and she had three older siblings named Shauna, Natasha, and James. Holly was described as being a gentle, caring, happy, lively, energetic little girl with a big imagination who dreamed of being a famous singer when she grew up. She took guitar lessons and singing lessons, and she adored Britney Spears' music. She loved dancing with her mom to Meatloaf's song for crying out loud. And when she was old enough, she began to attend St. Luigi's Catholic School in the Junction area of Toronto. At school, she was very well liked. She loved to play basketball. She ran cross country. And her story reminds me a lot of Britney Spears' school experience. The day before Holly vanished was Mother's Day, and Holly ended up giving her mother a present with a keychain that said happy mother's day on one side and i love you on the other her little card saying and i quote roses are red violets are blue but most of all i love you end quote this is a car that her mother Maria would end up keeping for decades after her daughter was murdered. The very next day on May 12th of 2003 would be the last day that Holly was ever seen alive. She was only 10 years old and she was having a very fun day after school that day, playing at her home with her best friend Claudia, who was nine years old. According to Holly's father that afternoon, Holly was trying to teach Claudia how to play chess, which was something that he had recently taught her to play. After that, they went and played dress up for a while, but eventually it was time for Claudia to go home. Now that evening, Holly insisted on walking her best friend Claudia home despite her parents not allowing her to walk alone. But Holly pleaded with her mother, telling her that she had promised Claudia's mother that she would walk her home. Now Maria and George and Holly's brother would actually end up going on a documentary called Crime Beat and they were interviewed on there. However, Crime Beat has copyrighted all of their stuff so I can't play any of it for you, but I definitely recommend going and looking at that documentary because it is, it's heartbreaking. It made me cry watching it. Either way, Maria seen how Holly wanted to practice some independence and she made the decision that she thought maybe this would be a good experience for Holly to, you know, finally be able to go somewhere on her own. It was only a couple blocks away. It was a path that she had taken many, many times before because Claudia actually lived on the same street that her school was on. So she shouldn't have been able to get lost. It was pretty much a straight shot there and it was broad daylight. So Maria decided Holly wanted to be a little bit more independent. She was getting a little bit older. Again, 10 years old isn't that old and this is a big city, but there does come a time when children need to experience some independence and you know learn that for themselves. So I could see Maria's thought process there. Unfortunately, this is one of those situations where one decision like this led to something absolutely horrific. And you can see how much regret Holly's family has for making that decision that day and it's heartbreaking. George ended up helping Holly put on a sweater and he told her to zip her jacket up because even though it was daylight out, it was raining a little bit outside. Holly was said to still be wearing her dress up clothes under her jacket that day when she left which makes the story even more heartbreaking to think that this little girl was just having a fun day. She was playing with her best friend. She was playing dress up. That's how young she was. And this was such a amazing high point in her day. And to think that something so horrific would happen to her after that is just, it's awful. So Holly and Claudia would end up leaving Holly's home on Sterling Road, heading north to Bloor Street West, and then they'd take the slight turn on the Perth Avenue. As I said, it was a route that Holly and Claudia had taken hundreds of times since it was the same street that their school was on. It was also only around 6 p.m. that day, so the sun was still shining even though it was raining a little bit. Now Holly and Claudia would actually make it to Claudia's home without incident, and Claudia's mother would offer to walk Holly back. However, Holly insisted she was a big girl. She wanted to walk back herself. She knew the route. And so Claudia's mother would be the last one to see Holly Jones alive around 6.30 p.m. that day. Sometime after Holly and Claudia left, I seen that Maria ended up going shopping and she would arrive home around 8 p.m. to find that Holly had not returned. Maria went and asked her son James if he had seen Holly and he hadn't. So she ended up calling across the street to where her husband George was asking if Holly was over there with him. However, George hadn't seen Holly either. Maria then frantically called Claudia's parents to see if maybe Holly had, you know, dawdled along, even though she was supposed to come right back. Maybe she ended up staying at Claudia's house to play for a longer time, or she met up with some other friends and were playing with them. However, no one had seen little Holly. This is when police would be called. However, right off the bat, police seemed to tell Maria that they didn't want to file a missing persons report yet because it was too early in her disappearance, which in my opinion is outrageous that a 10 year old little girl hasn't been seen for hours and police are saying it's too early 
to look for her to file a missing persons report, especially since the immediate time after someone goes missing is the most crucial time to look for them. But thankfully, Maria pressed the police, telling them that this was important and that she felt Holly was in danger. So police would finally begin the search. A command center would eventually be set up and police would begin going door to door searching for Holly, searching anywhere they thought a little girl could fit to hide or be hidden. However, it wouldn't be until 16 hours after Holly was last seen that an Amber Alert would be issued. And this was actually the first Amber Alert that was ever used in Canada. It was essentially a tester. And what's even crazier is that Holly's case actually didn't even meet the requirements for an Amber Amber Alert technically, because according to the requirements back then, you needed to either have evidence or seen someone abducting the child. I know some instances still in 2024, there are so many cases where the child doesn't meet the requirements because you need things like a vehicle description or a person of interest, a description of that. And if you don't have that stuff, then they're not going to put this Amber Alert out, which in my opinion, I feel like there shouldn't be such parameters around allowing the public to know that a child is missing. I feel like it should just be put out there like, hey, this little kid is missing. We don't know if they were abducted. We don't know if they're in a vehicle, but please look for them. Either way, they could be wandering the street and get injured. You know what I mean? Like there shouldn't be such parameters around something like that, in my opinion, just to let the public know to keep an eye out. But let me know how you feel about those rules. However, thankfully, police ignored the rules in this case and put one out anyways. As the morning came, Holly's sister, Shauna, would end up going on the news and pleading for her sister to come home. And Maria would also go on the news with George. She was crying uncontrollably and she was begging for Holly to be found safe saying, and I quote, whoever has her, I beg you. I beg you with all my heart that you keep her and bring her home to her mother and father. She hasn't ever hurt anyone in her life. She's a happy girl. I beg you not to hurt her, end quote. George would also urge Holly to escape if she was being held captive somewhere and offered a reward saying that no amount of money was too great. She's a happy girl. I beg you not to hurt her. Bring her home to us. It's honestly a really hard interview to watch. It's very heartbreaking to see these parents begging for their child's life. And it's very interesting to me when you compare interviews like this, where these parents are truly begging for their child's life to some interviews you see nowadays. And obviously everyone reacts to stress differently and to situations differently. But I think it's very interesting to see parents who are genuinely distraught and worrying where their child is to cases we see in the even 2024, where the parents are being interviewed and the emotion is lackluster to say the least. However, as Holly's family was begging on the news for her safe return, the nightmare was only getting worse. Because just 14 hours after Holly was last seen, a bag would end up washing ashore of Ward's Island on the Toronto waterfront, and it would be found by a man walking his dog. And inside of this bag, a naked, headless torso would be found. And not long after this, along the shores of Ontario Place, a second bag would end up being found, and it had been weighed down with a dumbbell, and inside of this bag contained a head and arms. But that very day, body parts would wash up on the shores of Ward's Island. And these remains would very quickly be identified as 10-year-old Holly Jones. Police telling the public, and I quote, the search for Holly Jones is now a search for her killer. We have a monster in our community, or monsters, who have perpetrated this very heinous crime on a very defenseless, innocent little girl. End quote. They would end up showing the two bags on the news in hopes that someone would recognize the bags. The first bag ended up being a black Lynx gym bag, and the second was a Cherokee black carry-on suitcase and they were urging anyone that had information to call the police. They also showed examples of what Holly was wearing when she disappeared, saying, and I quote, this killer, their plan has gone terribly awry. They thought they had committed the perfect crime. They thought they had done a textbook case, and what they've done is provide us with a substantial amount of evidence, end quote. And that is because the autopsy would eventually show that Holly had been essayed and strangled. But now the issue came for the police to find this sick predator that not only essayed, but then brutally murdered and chopped up this sweet little girl. Investigators would end up finding DNA under the fingernails of Holly's right hand. On top of that, more than 1,600 tips ended up being called in in her case. But things in the Junction area of Toronto began to get weirder because on June 2nd, a man would end up leading a young boy from a grocery store. However, he ended up being spooked when the mother ended up screaming and he left without abducting the little boy. Only a week later, a man ended up grabbing an eight-year-old girl's wrist as she was walking across the street with her mother, right at the intersection that Holly had disappeared from. Now here's the thing. In Canada, we don't have a public domain of PDF files like you do in the US. There are websites that you can just quick Google search away in the US and you can see all of the registered you know, S offenders, PDF files, all of that in your area. You can zoom in, you can see their name, their address, what their charges are. It's very detailed. We don't have something like that in Canada, unfortunately. However, Holly's murder would bring to light that there were more than 200 PDF files that lived within just a few kilometers of Perth Avenue in Bloor Street. 
200, an intersection not only Holly walked, but many, many families and their children lived in. And it's disgusting to me that information like this could save a child's life or anyone's life because it's not only PDF files. There are people out there that want to essay adults as well. And having this information could really determine who your neighbors are. You know, if you're going to get an apartment in a certain building, you can rent an apartment in a building, not knowing that your next door neighbor, you know, was convicted of essaying someone just like you. You could buy a house on a block, not knowing that there are five PDF files living next door and you let your children play on the streets. And I really do think it's an injustice to the Canadian people that we don't have access to something like this, that the U S does have, that we can't make informed decisions and know who our neighbors are and who is near us. But then again, in Canada, we like to reform a lot of these individuals. I say reform because in my opinion, I don't fully believe that people like this can be reformed. They're kind of just left to their own devices, it seems. And safety here in Canada, self-defense, that's a whole nother topic. We're not allowed to defend ourselves. It's it's really something here. Um, but when you add it all together and you look at it and see when something like this happens, it really makes you start to think what needs to change and what could have been prevented if we had more information. And as more and more attempted abductions were reported in the area, St. Luigi Catholic School increased security and social workers were brought in to help the students. The police have gone and obtained multiple DNA samples from men on Perth Avenue. And they were trying to eliminate people off their suspect list because they had this DNA. And if they went through and people submitted their own DNA, then we could wipe them out and they could focus on where they needed to look next. However, one man continued to refuse to give up his DNA. And this man was 35 year old Michael Briere, a software engineer who lived at 1450 Bloor Street West, an old Victorian fourplex that Holly would have walked directly by on the day of her disappearance. The neighbors would say that they ever so often spotted Michael sitting on the front steps that led to the first floor apartment he lived in and he would be drinking beer, but they said he was very unassuming and he really just kept to himself. Now, not only was he refusing to give up his DNA to police, but when police went into his home to talk to him and ask for this DNA sample, police would notice that he had green carpets. And that was important because police had actually found green fibers on Holly's body. On top of that, police noticed he also owned a dumbbell set. What really added to police's suspicion, however, was that Michael actually had children children's toys on his fireplace mantle. However, he ended up telling police that he didn't have any of his own children and that children never came over to his apartment. So of course, all of this really set off some red flags for police. So they ended up going back to Michael's apartment again to interview him on another occasion. And when they went back on the second time, they realized that Michael's green bath mats had mysteriously disappeared and there were new bath mats and a new shower curtain sitting on his kitchen table. So feeling like all of this and more was very suspicious, they ended up putting a 24 hour detail on Michael because they wanted to get a DNA sample from him. And if he wasn't gonna give it to them willingly, they were going to wait for him to slip up and they were gonna collect his DNA another way. And one day he would eventually slip up when he ended up throwing a soda can in a garbage can. However, this is a really weird coincidence, but when police ended up going into that garbage can to retrieve the soda can, there ended up being two identical soda cans in that garbage can. So when they ended up collecting them and running the DNA, one of the sets of DNA hit off. However, because there was this kind of mix up with the evidence since there were multiple cans, they ended up having to continue to trail him so that they could obtain a more isolated sample that could maybe hold up in court better or lead to an arrest warrant, et cetera, et cetera. Meaning this man was walking the streets for weeks after Holly's disappearance and murder. However, eventually Michael would slip up again. Police would end up collecting the item and this time, Michael's DNA would end up matching the skin and blood that was found under Holly's fingernails that she most likely got from when she was fighting for her life as Michael strangled her. Michael Breer would finally be arrested on June 20th of 2003, six weeks after Holly was kidnapped and murdered. But despite neighbors saying that Michael was a quiet guy that kept to himself, he held a very, very dark secret inside of that apartment. And the day that Holly went missing would be a turning point in this dark nightmare. We would later find out that that afternoon before Holly went missing, Michael was sitting inside of his apartment, drinking a large amount of alcohol and watching CP. He had a CP addiction, it seemed, and he called it his dark secret. And he very often would sit there and watch CP and fantasize about essaying little girls. And the day that Holly would go missing was the day that he finally decided that he wanted to make those dreams a reality. And he decided he was going to walk out of his apartment and pick the first little girl that he seen. And he was going to finally experience essaying a little girl himself. Michael didn't know Holly. 
she was just tragically in the wrong place at the wrong time as Michael exited his apartment after deciding he was going to do what he would eventually end up doing. He exited his apartment looking for a victim and Holly just happened to be walking by. According to Michael, when he spotted Holly, he ended up walking 10 steps past her, nervously looked around to see if anyone was watching. And when he realized the coast was clear, he ended up running back over to her and he grabbed her by the back of the neck saying, and I quote, she didn't scream. She was in total shock, end quote. From there, Michael ended up leading Holly down the dirty alleyway behind his home. She was walking towards her home. I looked around to see if anyone was on the street. I didn't see anyone. I just got carried away. I didn't know her. I grabbed her by the neck. She was in total shock. I went through the lane, through the narrow passage between my house and inside my apartment on the first floor. At that point, I knew she was gone. And once he was inside of his bedroom, the details from there are very hard to hear. But if Holly had to endure this, I think the least we can do is listen to understand how vile and unsafe of a man Michael Breer is, which is why we're doing this video today to begin with, to talk about why this man should not be let out into the public ever again. Once Michael had Holly in his bedroom, he would end up stripping off her clothes and then taking his own off as well. Michael then attempted to essay Holly. However, he claims that he never got to complete the act, however you want to take that. However, despite not allegedly fully going through with essaying her, even though police would later go on to say Holly was essayed, Michael knew that Holly was not going to survive this. He knew as soon as he kidnapped her that she was not going to ever see her family again. Saying, and I quote, probably when I was walking her to my place, I think at that point I realized it's already too late. Already at that point, I didn't want to get caught, end quote. So less than 30 minutes after Michael had abducted Holly off the street, he was strangling her to death. When she was dead, he then took a small handsaw and began to chop up her body. He then wrapped her body parts in plastic and put them inside of the duffel bag and the suitcase. There he would go toss her clothes in this garbage can that was near Young and Bloor. And then the next morning, he would take two separate trips on the TTC, which is Toronto's public transit system, like our bus and subway system. And he would bring Holly's body parts in these bags on the subway and he went downtown to the lake shore where he would go and dump the bags in the lake. Although they would end up washing up on shore just two hours later. He would later tell police that he thought he was actually going to get caught when he was on the subway because one of the bags that he had ended up leaking and blood was dripping onto the subway floor. And he said he thought a man had noticed because he was giving him a strange look, but he put his foot over the droplets of blood that were dripping and he ended up not getting caught because he went, he dumped the bags and it would be weeks later when he was eventually caught. However, Michael ended up keeping Holly's legs in his refrigerator because he was waiting to throw them in the garbage on garbage day. Later telling police, and I quote, you'll never find them, I put them in the garbage, end quote. And he ended up telling police this because Holly's family really, really just wanted to find all of her body parts. They wanted them all together before they could bury her. And I'm not sure if they ever did end up finding them. I didn't see anything about that. However, Michael told them that they weren't going to. But all of this would end up meaning that before anyone even noticed that Holly was missing, she was already dead. Now, despite all of this horrific shit that Michael Breer did, he would eventually go on to spare Holly's family a lengthy trial and he would plead guilty to first degree murder. Under a dark rainy sky, Maria Jones lived out her nightmare today arriving at the University Avenue courts to face Michael Breer. Jones wept softly as the five foot six portly Breer proclaimed loudly the word guilty to a charge of first degree murder. Dozens who arrived at the court to catch a glimpse of the killer sat in shock as prosecutors outlined their case. The deadly chain of events began at about six o'clock the evening of May 12th, 2003. And we know all of this information that I told you about today because Michael would admit it all to police. He'd eventually go on to talk about his, you know, sick desires of viewing CP and wanting to essay little girls. That was like his biggest fantasy. And he would end up describing what he did to Holly as cruel, inhumane, and nightmarish. And from here, he would receive a life sentence, which I'm pretty sure is 25 years in Canada, if I'm not mistaken. But Michael would also go on to say he wanted to... I don't know, help parents in the future against other predators. And he would tell police that if Holly had screamed, he would have let her go. However, Holly was way too terrified when Michael grabbed her to make any noise. And Michael would end up saying it's for parents to tell their children to scream if a predator tries to take them because it would have scared him off. I mean, we did see that work when that little boy was going to be abducted from the grocery store in the area and the mother screamed and so the man ran off. Now, I'm really, really curious if they ever caught these men. I'd want to say maybe it was Michael Breer as well, but it seemed like Michael Breer was into little girls. But we've seen this with different murderers before where in the aftermath, they'll put out these like tips of like, 
oh, you should do this because I would have reacted a different way if my victim had done this or they would have survived, et cetera, et cetera. And in this case, Michael is, you know, telling parents to teach your children to scream, yell for help something because it'll scare the predator off. A little too late considering what he did to Holly. In the aftermath, Holly's family would end up creating a memorial in their backyard for her, the community donating things like fountains and stone angels and flowers. And Holly's body being found on Ward's Island was pretty heartbreaking for the family, it seemed, because Ward's Island is part of the Toronto Islands and Center Island is on or near Ward's Island. And Center Island is a place where families and children go during the summer, especially I used to go as a kid. We used to go on school field trips there and there's things like biking and, you know, beaches there. There's kind of like a carnival of sorts that they have on the island as well and things for children to do and families to do. And Holly's family used to go there as well all the time. They even went there for Holly's birthday one time. So the fact that some of her body parts were found on the island, it kind of tainted that, it tarnished it. It's just really sad that Michael Breer destroyed not only this little girl's life, but her family's life. And he destroyed, you know, the feeling of happiness in certain places. It's sad. It's truly, truly sad. And my heart goes out to Holly's family and her friends. It's awful, it's tragic. And the whole reason that I'm doing this video today is because I'm hoping that we can prevent this from happening again. Because Michael Breer will actually be up for parole in 2028, just four years from now. And as we've learned today, this man is a monster and he does not deserve to walk the streets ever again and to victimize and to terrorize and to hurt another child like he did to Holly. As I talk quite often about the laws in Canada, they're very lax. They like to reform criminals. However, in my opinion, I don't think a man that watches CP for fun and fantasizes about essaying little girls and then goes on to act on those impulses and kidnap, murder, essay a little girl and then try to get away with it is someone that deserves remorse. I don't think that's someone that can be reformed. And my question to you all is, do you believe that Michael Breer has been reformed enough that he's able to walk the streets and be around children again and be around families again and be around anyone again. Now I did find a change.org petition to keep Michael in prison. So I'm gonna have that down below. I signed it. I recommend you all go and sign it. And if you're able to share this video in the petition, I really do think it may help. But that is the tragic story of Holly Jones. I think this is a case that needs to be more talked about. I think this is a situation that needs to be more talked about. Again, I don't think Michael Breer should ever be able to walk the streets again, but let's have a conversation about this down below. I'll be in the comment section chatting with you all. And as always, I hope you all stay safe out there, lock your windows and doors, and I hope to see you in the next video.